Well, good morning, church. Once again, we have the privilege of gathering as a body to worship our Savior in song and praise and prayer and giving. And now, by God's grace, we get to worship him in the exposition of his word. So if you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. As we, by God's grace, again, will conclude our study in the book of Jude. Now, as you're turning there, uh, next week, uh, we will begin a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the Gospel of Luke. We've been uh, going through Luke in Sunday school, but at a rather rapid pace. And uh, in trying to um, cover Luke and uh, 12, I think 12 or 14 lessons has been uh, has proven quite a challenge for those who have uh, uh, set out to uh, teach you that book. So uh, I believe that it's important to go back to the book of Luke and teach it properly. Uh, not that a summary of Luke is not beneficial, but at least for me, and I'm sure I can speak to the other Sunday school teachers, um, it is uh, important and I think most beneficial to go through the gospel slowly uh, and really glean uh, what the Word of God has for us. So for homework, uh, go ahead and uh, begin reading the Gospel of Luke as we will begin studying it next Sunday, God willing. But this morning, we gather to uh, conclude our studies in the book of Jude. Now, uh, beloved, as we continue in this uh, study, uh, and conclude with verses 17 through 25, uh, where Jude gives his final exhortation to the church, we uh, must remember that given that the nature of Scripture, we shouldn't find it odd that when we study God's Word, we notice that little has changed regarding man's depravity. Technology has advanced and knowledge has increased exponentially. Still, the human heart remains at odds with, or to use biblical, a biblical word, the human heart remains at enmity with God who created him. As Bible-believing Christians, we know that this is a primary reason why so much evil exists and is happening in the world today. For we know that from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, from beginning to end, God clearly instructs us on how his intimate relationship with us can be restored through his son, Jesus Christ. Through scripture, God has warned us and warns us against willful disobedience and unbelief. Through his word, he calls us to repent and to trust in him. And through his word, he calls us to contend for the faith so that others may come to the salvation and escape God's wrath. Now, the letter of Jude, therefore, is timely, for through it, we are reminded, as in verse 1, that we as Christ's bride, his church, have been called and are loved by God the Father, who will persevere in us and for his Son, Jesus Christ. And indeed, the church has been called and empowered to contend earnestly for the faith, that is, for the actual Christian teaching that brings salvation to the, to the lost. Now, in verses 3 and 4 of the book of Jude, we were reminded that some in the church, as we would attest, even, uh, it, even, it is even true today, are genuinely not saved, but are rather deceivers who have crept into the church looking to deceive true believers with man-centered doctrines contradicting true biblical teaching. Now these people, Jude taught us, taught doctrines that allow the sinful use of the flesh under the cover of God's grace. Now Jude then gives examples of how nations and angels and individuals disobeyed God's word and ended up paying a heavy price for their disobedience. These things we saw in verses 5 through 7. Followed by the destruction of these false teachers who, whose, dreadful end, end, whose dreadful end was prophesied in verses 8 through 16. Now the Bible tells us that these people were identified by their moral defilement 
rejection of authority and shocking and reverence of God, or as Jude puts it, he characterized them as ungodly people. Now, as we come to verses 17 to verse 25, Jews gives us instructions on how to go about what he called us to in verse 3, which is to contend earnestly for the faith that God has once for all handed down or delivered to the saints. So that we as Christians are to obey. So the question is, how, we, how may we as Christians do what Jude exhorts us to do, to contend earnestly for the faith that God has once delivered to the saints? Well, please allow me to read our text for this morning and then ask for God's blessing upon our study. So if you're there, please follow along as I read verse 17 through verse 25. Thus says the word of the Lord, Jude continuing his exhortation to the church by saying, But you, beloved, must remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, In the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are those, or these are the ones, who cause divisions, worldly-minded, not having the Spirit, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And on some who are doubting, have mercy, and for others, save Snatching, snatching them out of the fire, and on others have mercy with fear, hating even the tunic polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to gather as a church this morning, not only to, to read it. And now, Father, we pray that through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, you would grant us discernment and under, understanding. Lord, that we may hear learn, and most importantly, hear in order to obey your word. Again, we ask that you go before us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, in our text this morning, Jude gives us four instructions on how we may contend for the faith. If, or as he said in verse 3, he exhorts us to contend earnestly here in verses 17 through 25, he tells us how we as a church may be able to contend for the faith. So four instructions on how we may be able to contend for the faith that God has once delivered to us. First, we see this in verses 17 through 19, and that is that we are called to remember God's word. How do we contend for the faith? First, or number one, remember God's word. Notice what he says. He says, but you, beloved, speaking to the church, must remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, please notice that Jude does not give any new revelation or method for the church to fight for the Christian faith. Jude calls the church to stick to what it has already been taught. To stick to what it already has, God's word, the same word that strengthened and protected the early church. For example, listen to what it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42, where it says, So then, those who had received his, that is Peter's word, were baptized. And that day they were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching 
and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, why was the church so strong and growing in the beginning? It was because they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, where, which are, in essence, Christ's teachings. So this, too, was the case for the apostle Paul. Notice what he says, or listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, where he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, he's telling the church, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Then Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, he says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And lastly, listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, where he says, How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That salvation, first spoken by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard. This, of course, is alluding to the disciples. Now, beloved, this is the same admonition that even the apostle Peter gives in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, when he says, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So, beloved, we, like the Church of Jude's time, are to contend for the faith by first remembering the foundational teachings given to us by the Holy Spirit through his spokespeople, through his spokesmen, the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament. Now, sadly, when contending for the Christian faith, the church tends to use other things, such as gimmicks and entertainment to, to draw people to the faith instead of sticking to what the Bible tells us to stick to. Just stick to the Word of God. It's never failed. It's always worked. Now, you may have heard that in some churches, particularly last week, you may have heard that in their Easter service advertisements, that they either mail out, and even in their pastor's Easter message, the word resurrection or death will not appear out of fear that the non-believer will not get it, or out of fear that the non-believer would be turned off in any way. Now, beloved, we know that this is absolute nonsense, because how can one celebrate the resurrection of our Lord for that is what we celebrate, right? The resurrection of our Lord, Jesus Christ, without addressing sin, death, atonement, and forgiveness. And why should the church be more concerned about unbelievers not getting it than feeding the flock of God with God's word? Now, this does not mean that we shouldn't be mindful of those who may lack knowledge of God's word. Yes, we should be mindful of explaining God's word properly, using terms that may be easier to grasp initially. But we should never replace God's word with our own understanding. Thinking, you know what, let's leave the word propitiation or sin and death out because that might be a turnoff for the, for the non-believer. But we have to say, well, that's not the point. We're, we're all unbelievers at one point. We were all ignorant of God's word. But by his grace, what did he do? As, as saved men and women, we continue to not forsake the assembly and come to church and hear God's word. What did he do to us? He taught us, did he not? He instructed us by his word. After a while, we began to understand certain words. Why? Because we, we looked them up or we even asked our pastors and our teachers. Let us be thankful that by God's grace, he had allowed us at one point to go to a church that would challenge us to study, to learn. 
and not simply keep the word of God dumbed down so that we can get it. God taught us through his word, through godly teachers and godly churches who uphold his word. So, how are we to fight for the faith? Again, Jude says that we must remember the fundamental teachings and warnings of the apostles. It's the word of God. No gimmicks. Nothing new. No, no, no novelty. Beloved, no one is ever genuinely saved through novel things or gimmicks. How are people saved? How are we saved? By hearing the word of God. So we must remember the fundamental teachings. Remember God's word. And notice verse 18. Describing what the apostles taught. That they were saying to you, in the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. Now the question is, is this true? Absolutely, of course. We don't have to look too far to confirm such prophecy, for we see precisely what Jude describes here in verses 18 and 19. We see that those who mock God and the Christian faith are both outside and are within the church, where there are people who, as verse 19 says, cause divisions, are worldly-minded, not having the spirit. Now, Jews says that first, describing these people, that they are men who cause division or who divide you. Now, the word here is it's a rare word that may mean that they made distinctions. Now, Barker is helpful here when he says that this perhaps pointed to the activity of, 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 the, of, the, of what later became Gnosticism, or the known as later Gnostics, who divided Christians by classifying them into groups of lesser and more spiritual. Now, this we see even today, I suggest, where many false prophets seek to divide the church, often using the claims of biblical Christianity, is no longer enough, or is in fact wrong and then proceed to add what they believe is missing in the Bible's teachings. Beloved, this is a trademark of many false religions, such as Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, whose founders will tell you that they, that they were called by God to teach the word correctly, for it has been taught incorrectly for the millennia prior to their coming. That God sent him, sent them particularly to teach the real truth. And many of these false prophets added to the scripture or took away from scripture. We're told to be careful. We're told to guard against those who have crept into the church and introduced division. And often division is introduced by those who claim that they know better. They either add or take away from the Bible's teaching. Now second, notice that Jews says that they are worldly-minded men driven by the flesh. These are people whose minds do not stay on Christ and his word, but instead are carnally driven. These are expert justifiers, if you will, of worldly living under the auspices of God's grace. Oh, you're saved, aren't you? Oh, of course. Then you should live as you, as you want to. You're saved. These claim to be led by the Spirit of God when in fact they are devoid of the Holy Spirit altogether. Now we don't have to look far to see examples of these, beloved. We see this in the charismatic word of faith, name it and claim it movement all the time. We see pastors and church leaders falling into gross immorality. We see embezzlement in the church. Now, while teaching, uh, I'm reminded when I was thinking about this, while teaching at a pastor's conference in, in Mexico many years ago, a man came up to me and told me a story of his former pastor 
who was told by an anointed prophet visiting from the U.S. that he had married the wrong woman and that he was to divorce her and marry another in order to restore God's blessing upon his dwindling church. Sadly, the, the pastor obeyed this false prophet, divorced his wife, married another, and ultimately closed the church and left the ministry. I mean, is there any wonder? This is a sad example of what happens when one is ignorant of God's word and listens to people who claim to be spirit-filled when in fact they may not even be saved at all. Now, as Jude says, they do not have the Spirit. They are devoid of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's all we need to know about these false teachers. They are devoid of the Holy Spirit. Now, how can these people claim to speak on behalf of God when they don't possess the Spirit of God? And to this, the Apostle Paul speaks to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 12 to 14 when he says now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the depths graciously given to us by God of which depths we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom but in those taught by the spirit combining spiritual depths with spiritual words but a natural man does not accept the depths of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually examined, the Apostle Paul says. So this is why, beloved, we are called to appeal to the Word of God and nothing else. We are called to test every teaching by the Word of God to see if it is something that God has said through his chosen prophets and apostles. Again, we're not called to novelty. We are not called to new revelation. We are called to stick to what we know based on what we read in Scripture. Therefore, we are to remember God's Word. Now, this leads us to the second clear instruction and in how it is that we can contend for the faith. Second note is we are to grow in our Christian faith. Notice verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved, Jude says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So how is one to contend for the faith? You are to grow and pray. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Now, this verb means to engage. To build yourself means to engage in building, in a building process of personal and corporate development. Now, please note Jude's personal exhortation here. Build yourselves. Here, he squarely places the responsibility of Christian growth on each individual. Yes, the church has teachers, pastors, elders. But please note the responsibility where the responsibility ultimately lies for spiritual growth. For spiritual growth, it lies on the individual. Building yourselves. Again, note Jude's personal exhortation. He squarely places the responsibility of growth in the faith, of Christian growth. On each individual so how can a Christ so how can Christians build themselves or in other words grow in their faith well first you need to have fellowship with the Lord and his people that is by studying God's Word and not forsaking forsaking the assembly of believers remember beloved you will become like the people you hang around you hang around with most how many, how many have told your teenage kids that? You will become like the people you hang around with the most. So hang out with those who share your passion for God, his word, and his church. Right? So build this is one of the ways that you can build yourself. 
in the faith. Grow in your faith. You also grow, notice, by praying in the Holy Spirit. Christians are to be praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, because all believers have the Spirit, they are able to pray according to the Spirit's will that is set forth in God's Word to accomplish God's work by God's power. Now, to alleviate any confusion, to pray in the Holy Spirit means to pray according to the Spirit's leading. It has been said, prayer is not getting man's will done on he in heaven. It is getting God's will done on earth. This agrees with what John teaches in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. So to pray in the Holy Spirit is to pray in accordance to God's will. If there's any time that you pray something that does not, that you know is not God's will, then it's not going to be heard. It's not coming from God or to him. Instead, when we pray, we need to ensure that we are praying in the will of God or according to the, the spirit of God. So we need to grow in our spiritual walk. We need to be men and women of, of prayer. Okay, and notice next, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. So, we contend for the faith by remembering God's word, by making a commitment to grow in our Christian walk, by studying God's word, by praying in accordance to the Holy Spirit, and by keeping ourselves in the love of God. Here, we see that Christians are to keep themselves in God's love. That is, the realm of God's love, we understand, is in Jesus Christ. And that those who depart from Christ depart from God's love. Those who reject Jesus, Jesus' commands, reject his love. Now, this is exactly what these people were, uh, were being characterized, these apostates. By not following Christ's commands, they were in fact not keeping themselves in the love of God. Listen to what John uh, 15 says, verses 9 through 10, Jesus speaking when he says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So, how does one keep themselves in God's love? Just like what Jesus says. Keep His commandments. Keep His words. Keep His word, ultimately. And as you do, you, therefore, keep yourself in the love of God. This is something that these false teachers, these apostates, were no longer doing. And as much as they were disobeying Christ's commands, they were no longer keeping themselves in the love of God. So we are to grow, we are to pray, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. And lastly, notice, we are to wait expectantly. Notice what he says, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So in contending for the faith, we are to keep our attention fixed on the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has purchased us for eternal life. Now, Jude here reminds us that salvation is never a matter of good works, and that our hope of salvation is only in Christ. Therefore, in contending for the faith, we must remember that we are called to, number one, we are called to grow, we are called to pray in the Holy Spirit, we are called to keep ourselves in the love of God, while, beloved, note, while anticipating the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that will ultimately be uh, culminating in our reunion with him. Here we see hope, the hope that lies before us, that we should all be anticipating by God's grace and his mercy. So thus far, Jude has given us two instructions on how to contend for the faith, right? Remember God's word, grow in your Christian life, and he gave us a little bit of, of how to do that. Now, the third instruction is this. How do we contend for the faith once delivered to the saints? Number three, exercise spiritual discernment. 
exercise spiritual discernment. This we see in verses 22 and 23. Notice how he continues to say, and on some who are doubting, he says, have mercy. Does the church need to watch out for those who claim to be Christians but live contrary, uh, contradictory lives? Absolutely. We've established that. However, Jude here calls us to discernment in that we must also be careful not to lump those struggling with doubt in their Christian faith with those who are worldly-minded or apostates. The church has genuinely converted people who are not yet fully grounded in the faith. Now, perhaps some of you at least we should all be able to remember a time when, in fact, we knew we were born again, but yet not mature yet. It took us a while. I don't know anybody who has been born of God and he's immediately a mature Christian. No, it, it takes a while. It's a process. Sometimes God leads us through, through it, it, into and out of certain churches only to have us land in a church that, where we can now grow. I, I could just recall the time of uh, being just uh, newly born again, and I can just thinking back, if God would have placed me in a, in a solidly mature, just Christian church that is just expositing the word of God, I'm sure I would have grown uh, uh, eventually, but I wonder how God might have been so gracious and loving to me that he kept me in a church that was just enough. Where they explained the, the word of God just at, almost at my level as a baby Christian. But then to see God move me from, move my family and I through that and have us land in a church that uh, you know, we finally we were just able to just grow exponentially because of the depth of the teaching. Perhaps you've experienced some of that yourself. So the point here is that we must be careful not to lump those who are struggling with doubt. Remember as a young believer, did you not struggle with doubt at some point? Did you not struggle with, with not, getting, not getting some things? And perhaps even shortly after becoming a Christian, you were, you, you were confronted with the reality that, you know what, I'm not sure if I get this. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm actually saved because I don't seem to be getting it like the rest of the people around me are getting it. No, we must exercise spiritual discernment, beloved. And knowing that we are all at different levels in our sanctification. We are all at different levels in our spiritual walk. And we must be, be mindful and discerning that there may be some in the church who are still new to their faith, struggling, perhaps even with doubt. And the last thing we ought to do is lump the men with apostates or with non-believers, when in fact they are believers, but they're just needing to grow a little bit. Okay, so we must exercise spiritual discernment. And that's what he says on some who are doubting, have mercy, be patient, And ask if they understand what you said, and if not, explain it in another way. Help them to get it. Help them to understand. Our responsibility is to have mercy on them and show compassion towards them by seeking to lead them away from the influence of false teachers. We must do this with love and with patience, remembering that Immature believers are like young children who need to be taught by mature believers. Beloved, I suggest to you that a, that a sign of a mature believer is one who is discerning and is able to discern that before them, God may have placed a genuine believer that just needs to be discipled and taught with patience and love. Now, mixed with immature believers, there may be those who think they are saved but may not truly be saved. 
The spiritually mature believer must therefore discern whether these folks are genuinely there to seek and follow Christ or are being led astray by false teachers. And that's what Jude continues by saying. And for others, verse 23, save, snatching them out of the fire. Now, beloved, we know that Christian love dictates that mature Christians deal with these people directly and vigorously. With these, by these people, I mean those who think they are saved, but in fact they are not. And how is it that we can know that they are not? Of course, one would, would lay claim that we are not omniscient. We don't know the heart of a person, and that is true. But as mature believers, we are given discernment to be fruit inspectors, right? Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits, by their fruits you will know them. Although we have no right, no right to condemn someone to hell. We have no right to declare someone an unbeliever simply by our own understanding. We are called to use discernment in inspecting the fruit. If a person says they are generally born again, but is living in a completely contradictory way to what the scripture teaches, then love dictates that we confront such a person and say, my friend, you say you're, sa you say you're saved, you believe that you're saved, but in fact, what you do, how you live, your life proves otherwise. Oh, you're just judging me. I am not judging you. I'm just doing what the word of God tells me to do to inspect the fruit and the fruit, meaning that which comes from your life, that which is displayed by your, by your living, is not, is not in, 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 in any way, uh, does not in any way prove that you are genuinely a changed person. Now, God forbid, or far be it from us to say that I believe you should be at this level. If you're not at this level, then you're not surely saved. No, that, that's, not that's not at all what the word is calling us to do. We are, as mature believers, called to be discerning and sane. Let me show you what the Bible says. You are acting in contradiction to what the Bible says. You could not be continually acting, or that is, living in contradiction to the word of God and still believe you're saved. My friend, you may not be. Because your lifestyle doesn't prove that you've been regenerated. Now we must be careful, because the standard of such a person's faith or what you believe they ought to be, ought not to be your own righteousness. We must be very careful. And ever thinking that, well, if you were just as holy as me, then I would believe that you were a truly a born-again believer. God, <laughs> far be it from us, beloved. Instead, as I look to Christ and I look to his word, he is the standard. The word is the standard. I'm not going to measure you by my own standard because, in fact, I will tell you that I'm worse than you. But based on the standard of the word of God, I'm coming to you because love dictates. Because you think you're saved when, in fact, you may not be. And the Bible calls me to in love to confront you and, if all possible, snatch you out of the fire. Now we know, beloved, that salvation is all of God. He does it all. We as Christians are simply God's instruments for bringing God's word to the law so that they may be saved. So please don't misunderstand Jude and saying or, or, or believing or Jude saying and you believing that you have the power to save somebody. You don't. Only God does that. But as mature believers, as a church, we are called to go and tell people. And in so doing, if it's God's will, if it's God's will for that person, snatching them out of the fire by hopefully helping them to see the error of their ways in love, of course, so that they may repent and turn to Christ for genuine salvation. 
Again, this only happens as we lovingly confront the unbeliever. Even within the church sometimes, beloved. We must do so cautiously, as Jude continues to say, when he says, and on others have mercy with fear. The rest of verse 23, hating even the tunic polluted by the flesh. Now, Risby is very helpful here when he warns us by saying, and I quote, in trying to help those who have erred, we must be careful not to be trapped ourselves. Many, a would-be rescuer has drowned himself. What a great illustration, isn't it? Many a would-be rescuer has drowned himself. When an unstable believer has been captured by false doctrine, we must be very careful as we try to help him, for Satan can use him to defile us. In trying to save him, we may be stained or burned ourselves, close quote. Tremendous insight here, and obviously goes with what Jude is saying. On others have mercy with fear, hating even the tunic polluted by their flesh. Now here, beloved, Jude pictures a person whose depravity has made them infectious. Christians, therefore, are to show mercy, as in the first case, but now they are to do so with fear lest the infection spread to them. We must be very, very careful. As mature believers, we ought to hate sin. First, our sin, and second, sin in general, in the world and in others. We would be doing a person a tremendous disservice if we, in, in love, seeking to snatch them out of the flames of the fire, if you will, not call sin, sin out of fear of hurting their feelings or out of fear that they are going to feel offended or, or disrespected. Beloved, you cannot coddle sin. You can't. You cannot sugarcoat things because the more you, you, you maintain that mentality, you run the danger of getting caught in sin yourself. If you pre present sin to an unbeliever as something as, as, well, you're trying, it's just a mistake, and not call it for what it is, and warn against, uh, uh, warn against continuing in that lifestyle or in that sin, um, as every person who does not repent and does not turn away from that will eventually be judged. In love, we must be very clear when it comes to sin and not try to sugarcoat things because we may run the danger of minimizing sin. If we minimize sin in another person's life, think of the danger that if we keep that mentality, we could get to a point where we minimize our own and begin to justify things. No, 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 we need to be very, very careful, right? And trying to save a person unbeliever, we may be stained or burned ourselves if we're not careful with explaining what sin is unapologetically. So again, here Jude pictures a person whose depravity has made them infections, and we are to show mercy in these first case, but then we are to do so with fear lest the infection spread to us. So, Jude here gives clear instruction, right, on how to contend for the faith. First, by remembering God's word. Second, by growing in your Christian life. Third, by exercising spiritual discernment. And lastly, it is by committing yourselves to Jesus Christ. Verses 24 and 25. Jude continues by saying, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, he says. Now here, Jude reminds us that after all that has been humanly done in exercising our responsibility to remember, to grow, to discern, it ultimately all depends on Christ's power to keep us and make us victorious. I love how he ends here. Although we must acknowledge our responsibility, it is foolish to think that we can succeed 
in our own faith and in our own power. This Paul reminds us of in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, where it says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Far be it from us, beloved, to think that we can do anything in and of ourselves. We can't. We must always keep our weakness in mind, remembering what Jesus told Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11, 9 through 11, when he says, Paul praying and Jesus answering, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul continues by saying, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions and hardships for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I when I am weak, then I am strong. I have become foolish. You yourselves compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in no respect I was inferior to the most eminent apostles, even if I am nothing. Oh, beloved, let us never forget that anything good that may come from us is only because God can safeguard us against falling and even cause us to stand without blemish before God's presence with great joy. It is only by the work of Christ that we can do that. It's not by our own merit. Therefore, with Jude, we must all exclaim. Listen to what he says in verse 25. To the only God, our Savior. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, how we thank you so much for your word and how through Jude you remind us how it is that we can contend for the faith that you've delivered to us. Lord, help us remember that to contend for the faith, we must remember your word. There's nothing more secure. There's nothing more sure than your word. Help us to stand fast and remember your word. Secondly, Lord, help us grow in our Christian faith. Help us become mature men and women of prayer. Help us, Lord, exercise spiritual discernment. Help us know when we need to be direct and, and, and sometimes tough in love with some and yet gentle and showing mercy to others. Lastly, Lord, help us commit ourselves entirely to you, knowing that it is in you we have strength. It is in you that we can stand firm, as we are ever so mindful that in and of ourselves we are weak and incapable of doing what you've called us to do. Oh, precious Holy Spirit, we pray that you would empower us to not only hear these words, read these words, read these words, but now help us to obey these words. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.